Good evening and uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Eric Banks and I am director of the New York Institute for the Humanities at NYU. We are pleased to serve as co-sponsor tonight of the Humanities Initiative's first uh, Great Books in the Humanities event of the season, a monthly presentation marking the appearance of titles that should be of interest to a broad audience. And uh, judging by the size of the audience tonight, the turnout, it looks like that's the case. So I'm very happy that you braved the icy cold to be with us. This evening, uh, we are here to celebrate the publication of the Dictionary of Untranslatables, a philosophical lexicon published by Princeton University Press. I hope you saw the copy out front, and I'll try and lift it. It's actually a nice little workout. Uh, this publication is a translation project of massive proportions, including some 400 entries on topics ranging from, quote, abstraction, which is the first term in the book, to Wunsch, the final entry, some 1,200 pages later. The book was first published in French 10 years ago as Vocabulaire Européen de Philosophie with the decisive subtitle Dictionnaire des Intraduisibles. Pardon my French. The inspired project of the scholar of uh, classical philosophy, Barbara Cassin. As Emily After points out in her introduction to the English edition, uh, Cassin's project might be appreciated as a meeting of the grand dictionaries of humanist and philosophical thought crossed with the approach of Raymond Williams' keywords. Kassan's book, begun in uh, 1998, was nothing less than an attempt to recast the history of philosophy through the lens of the untranslatable. That lexicon of terms that are frequently left untranslated as they are transferred from language to language. You can fill in plenty of examples, um, and you're likely to find them in this book. It's a work that reflects the hall of mirrors of translation and the work of both mistranslation and retranslation, and a fascinating project. When the book was published in 2004 by So. It became an object of international interest. Um, it has already been translated or is in the process of being translated into Arabic, Farsi, Romanian, Russian, and Ukrainian. And tonight we can comment that English is joining that list of languages. Uh, the three editors who join us tonight took over the task of thinking about how to render such a particular book composed in French into intelligible form in English while communicating the performative dimension of the project to ask what it means and what's at stake in translating the untranslatable. Three editors who join us tonight, Michael Wood, Jacques Lesra, and Emily Apter, and I'm going in this order, which I'm going to give my introduction to the second, we'll go in reverse order, uh, were part of a network that included five translators and more than 150 scholars to describe the history of each term, the context of its various translations, and to consider the term's relative linguistic portability or that lack thereof. In addition, there are essays on a number of key languages that play a part in the dictionary. Um, tonight, each of the editors will discuss a single term included in the dictionary, and we will follow with a brief Q&A. Uh, before I introduce them and our moderator, Jane Tylus, I'd like to remind you that this is a good time to check and make sure your cell phone is turned off. And I'd also like to uh, invite you to join us for a brief reception afterward. Um, also, before I introduce the panelists, I've been asked to remind you uh, about the next um, public event uh, sp sponsored by the Humanities Initiative, which is in the Writer's Writing Series. Um, it's featuring the writers uh, Maza Min Mazam and and Gilbert King, and they'll be in conversation uh, about the role of history in their writing and how they integrate uh, their concepts of history in their, in their own work. Uh, for more details, you can uh, check out the Humanities Initiative website, and uh, we hope to see you then. Uh, now just a brief introduction of our uh, three accomplished panelists. Uh, first on the far right is Emily Apter. Um, Emily Apter is Professor of French and Comparative Literature at New York University. Her most recent books include The Translation Zone, a New Comparative Literature, which is 2006, Continental Drift from National Characters to Virtual Subjects, 1999, and Fetishism as Cultural Discourse, which she co-edited with William Peets in 1993. Most recently, she's the author of Against World Literature on the Politics of Untranslatability, uh, which was published this summer by Verso Books. After has contributed to publications including Third Text, Boundary Two, New Literary History, Art Form, Critical Inquiry, and October, um, as well as Translation Studies, PMLA, and Cabinet. Since 1998, she's edited the book series uh, Translation, Transnation for Princeton University Press. And together with Bruno Bastilles, she's working on an edition of Alain Badiou's Writings on Literature and Politics. Uh, to Emily's left, we're uh, happy to welcome uh, Jacques Lesra. Jacques Lesra is professor of comparative literature, English, German, and Spanish and Portuguese, and chair of the comparative literature department at NYU. And as you mentioned beforehand, he is that's for another 11 weeks and counting. Um, he is a specialist in the literature of the Renaissance and early modern period, um, Cervantes and Shakespeare in particular, and, and in contemporary political philosophy. His most recent book is Wild Materialism, 
The Ethic of Terror in the Modern Republic, which was published in the U.S. in 2010 and was just recently uh, translated into Chinese. Uh, Professor Lezer is the author as well of un uh, Unspeakable Subjects, the Genealogy of the Event in Early Modern Europe, uh, published in 1997, and editor of Spanish Republic, 2005, and Depositions, Altizer, Balabar, Masheray, and the Labor of Reading. Um, he has a couple of forthcoming books, uh, Principles of Insufficient Reason, uh, Mediation and Translation after Marx, and Accidental Modernity, the Drama of Translation between Spain and England, 1499 to 1625. Um, to his left and to my right um, is Michael Wood. He's joining us tonight from Princeton, where he's Professor Emeritus of English and Comparative Literature. Uh, Michael Wood is the author of numerous books, including Literature and the Taste of Knowledge, published in 2005, Yates and Violence, published by Oxford University Press in 2010, A Very Short Introduction to Film, published in 2012, and The Letters of Italo Calvino, which he edited uh, and, uh, with, uh, for Princeton University Press and which appeared this summer. His short biographical study of Hitchcock is forthcoming this year from Amazon Houghton Mifflin, and he is at work on a book titled The Uses of Distraction. He's also a regular contributor to numerous publications, including the London Review of Books, where since 2006 he has written a regular column on film. So we're glad and happy to have all three editors with us tonight. And uh, it's my pleasure also to introduce our moderator, Jane Tylus, who is professor of Italian studies and comparative literature um, at, here at NYU. And since 2007, she has been faculty director of the Humanities Initiative. She's the translator of two Italian women poets, Lucrezia Tornabuono uh, di Medici and uh, Gaspara Stampa. She's co-editing a forthcoming volume of essays from University of Pennsylvania Press with Karen Newman called Early Modern Cultures of Translation. So I now turn it over to Jane. Thank you. It's really a pleasure to be here. And as moderator, I'll be very moderate in my uh, opening comments. Eric's done a great job um, really talking about the book. And each of our three panelists will be speaking about one of the many, many terms in the Dictionary of Untranslatables for you tonight. But I wanted to just start by invoking the patron saint of translation. Um, I don't know, Jacques or Emily, is there a way to go to an, another image on the computer for a second? Um, I thought we can't invoke him without Saint his Jerome. image. Um, it's a Saint Jerome in his study by the Sicilian painter Antonella da Messina. Um, there he is, sitting in his study. And, and I thought of this um, actually late last night as I was thinking about what to say this afternoon. And, and one day, about two years ago, I was going to visit Suzanne Wofford, uh, Jacques' wife, in their apartment. And as I was walking through the hallway, I saw Jacques in a side room, um, bent over two computers, kind of going back from one computer to the other. He was working on the dictionary. And it, he reminded me of St. Jerome at that moment <laughs> um, in this uh, image, um, partly because of his, you know, naturally very austere bearing, of course. He didn't have the red cap and there was no peacock. Um, but uh, the kind of work that obviously Jacques and Michael and Emily have done for this marvelous volume, I think really is very Jerome-esque um, in a lot of ways. Jerome, of course, as, as, the, as the not only the cardinal and the saint, but the translator of the uh, both the Hebrew Old Testament and the Greek New Testament into the Latin Vulgate. Now, uh, Antonio paint, Antonello de Messina painted this uh, in the late 1470s. It was about the moment that a the kind of new Jerome uh, of at least early modernity was born. Uh, this was the great Dutch scholar Erasmus, who in many ways is the early modern saint, I think, of translation. Uh, this was an Erasmus um, who helped define the intellectual and religious contours of modern Europe, uh, an Erasmus whose lingua franca, of course, was Latin at a moment when the vernacular was really emerging in modern Europe, but also a, a, an Erasmus who was himself, of course, a great translator. And he was a translator principally of, of this guy, of Jerome, uh, Jerome's epistles on the one hand, but also of Jerome's Vulgate on the other. Uh, what Erasmus dared to do was to retranslate uh, the Greek New Testament, so challenging Jerome's uh, Latin and the Vulgate itself. And as you might expect, the work that, Jer that Erasmus did was assailed by more conservative Catholics. Um, he claimed that he was making what had been a corrupt Latin. You can imagine over a thousand years since Jerome writing in the early fifth century, the manuscripts of uh, the Latin Vulgate had been uh, enormously corrupted. Uh, Erasmus said by going back to the source, he was not only finding the true Greek, but he was writing a Latin that would be accessible to all. First, he, in one edition of his New Testament, he said it would be accessible to the farmer, the tailor, the traveler, and the Turk. In a later edition, he expanded this list to include the farmer, the tailor, the mason, prostitutes, pimps, and the Turk. 
um, all as he was challenging these conservative Catholics uh, who he claimed were looking for a perfumed Bible and not the real thing. Um, obviously, he was challenging the, the bad manuscript recensions that had, that had come down over the years, but he was also challenging in some way Jerome, suggesting that Jerome himself had gotten things wrong as well as the original writers of the New Testament. For example, he notes that uh, Greek was not the mother tongue of the evangelists and that their use of it was uh, affected by their native idioms. That's when one critic demands, do you mean to say that the best Greek was not written by the apostles on whom the Holy Spirit conferred the gift of tongues? And Erasmus's response was this, my dear fellow, if you look at the list of languages of which the Holy Spirit gave command to the apostles on the day of Pentecost, you'll discover that Greek was not among them. Besides, the gift lasted only for a day. Now, what Erasmus, uh, whose works clearly did not take one day, and nor, of course, did Jerome's, uh, what Erasmus uh, really, uh, I think, tackles here uh, is the great Christian dream of transparency, the dream that there's no need for translation, the dream of a Pentecost, when you can speak in tongues. Uh, this is what Erasmus dismantles as he worked ferociously to establish what the original Greek meant, uh, such as the word logos, which he translated not as verbum, uh, but as sermo, the spoken word speech, as also, of course, discourse. And I note that the Dictionary of Untranslatables has a great entry on logos. It doesn't mention uh, Erasmus, but it does say something even more interesting, that the North African translations of the New Testament actually used uh, as their translation for logos, sermo, while the European translations uh, had verbum, which carried the day till Erasmus, as it were, got things right. Now, I don't mean to suggest in closing that Jacques, Emily, and Michael are new Erasmuses. Uh, they're not going back to original Greek texts, and they're not challenging the texts of Barbara Casson. But I do want to suggest that their work will open up uh, Casson's immense project to readers in English, pimps and prostitutes, I'm sure, among them. Um, and that it also suggests that, that like Erasmus, but also like Barbara Casson, uh, the dream of Pentecost, which is a dream of transparency, is a dream. Um, and if it was true, there would be no need for a book like this, and hence very little fun and very little interest in thinking about the marvelous ways that languages work. Mm -hmm.